Intrauterine growth retardation. Etiology and clinical implications. Intrauterine growth restriction, also known as fetal growth restriction, is a condition where a fetus is unable to achieve its genetically determined potential size. The etiology of intrauterine growth restriction is multifactorial, involving maternal, utero-placental, and fetal factors. Maternal causes. Substance use, including consumption of alcohol, cigarettes, cocaine, and heroin during pregnancy, can impair fetal growth. Certain medications have been identified as teratogenic and can contribute to intrauterine growth restriction. These include angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, carbamazepine, phenytoin, warfarin. Systemic diseases. Conditions that lead to placental insufficiency can result in intrauterine growth restriction. These diseases impact the placental function either directly or indirectly, affecting the nutrient and oxygen exchange between the mother and the fetus. Utero placental causes. Placental insufficiency. This is the most common cause of intrauterine growth restriction in the United States. Placental insufficiency is characterized by a disorder of the fetal maternal circulation, leading to inadequate blood flow and substance exchange to the placenta, resulting in metabolic compromise of the fetus. Causes and risk factors. Maternal smoking, diabetes mellitus with vasculopathy, chronic hypertension, severe anemia, anorexia nervosa, antiphospholipid syndrome, and systemic lupus erythematosus are significant maternal risk factors. Pregnancy-related conditions such as preeclampsia, rhesus incompatibility, placental previa, multiple gestations, and placental abruption also contribute to the development of placental insufficiency. Umbilical artery thrombosis or extensive infarction and uterine malformations, for example fibroids, can directly impact placental functionality and fetal growth. Fetal factors. Genetic abnormalities. Aneuploidy and other genetic disorders in the fetus can lead to symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction. Congenital conditions. Cyanotic congenital heart defects are known to affect fetal growth adversely. Infections. Early intrauterine infections, notably those classified under the torch complex, toxoplasmosis, other agents, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex, can also result in intrauterine growth restriction. Pathophysiology Recent advancements in understanding intrauterine growth restriction have led to a reconsideration of the traditional classification into symmetrical and asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction based on body proportions. Although this classification has been challenged due to its inability to reliably indicate the etiology of growth restriction, it remains in use for educational purposes and in some clinical resources. Types of intrauterine growth restriction. Asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction constitutes about 70% of intrauterine growth restriction cases, typically has a late onset and is often the result of maternal systemic diseases, causing placental insufficiency. This form of intrauterine growth restriction is characterized by the preferential distribution of blood flow to vital organs, like the brain and heart, leading to a disproportionate growth restriction where the head and brain are spared compared to the rest of the body. Symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction makes up about 30% of cases and is usually a consequence of early gestational insults, such as genetic abnormalities, congenital infections, or congenital heart disease. This form affects the fetus uniformly, leading to a proportional reduction in the size of the fetus. Asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction. Etiology and pathogenesis. Asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction is primarily the result of extrinsic factors affecting the fetus during the later stages of gestation, typically in the third trimester. The core issue arises from impaired functioning of the utero-placental unit, leading to insufficient transplacental delivery of oxygen and nutrients. This impairment also affects the elimination of carbon dioxide and metabolic waste products from the fetal to the maternal circulation. Effects on fetal development. The fetus experiences apoxia, reduced oxygen levels, and hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, 
prompting a physiological response to shunt blood flow towards essential organs like the brain, heart, and adrenal glands at the expense of other tissues such as the liver, muscles, and fat. This adaptive response includes a switch to anaerobic glycolysis for energy production, leading to metabolic acidosis and accumulation of lactic acid. Such conditions can cause progressive damage to vital organs, potentially resulting in permanent damage or even fetal death. Impact on Maternal Health Asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction is associated with decreased placental growth, characterized by reduced placental surface area, further impairing placental function. This condition elevates the risk of maternal complications, including preeclampsia, preterm labor, and vaginal bleeding. Symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction. Etiology. Symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction is attributed to intrinsic factors that affects the fetus early in gestation. These factors include genetic abnormalities and infections, impacting the fetus uniformly. Pathogenesis. Intrinsic factors cause a uniform restriction in fetal growth as the insult occurs early in gestation, affecting the overall development of the fetus. This type of growth restriction reflects a more generalized slowdown in fetal growth rather than a late pregnancy adaptive response to extrinsic factors. Clinical features. Intrauterine growth restriction presents distinct clinical features that can be observed in both the fetus and the mother. Fetal signs. One of the primary indicators of intrauterine growth restriction is a fetus that measures small for gestational age, typically defined as a birth weight below the 10th percentile for the gestational age. A reduction or absence of fetal movements can be a concerning sign, suggesting compromised fetal well-being. Asymmetrical intrauterine growth restriction is characterized by disproportionate growth restriction, where the head dimensions remain normal, but the body and limbs appear thin and small. This pattern suggests a later gestational insult, affecting the fetus's ability to deposit fat and muscle. Symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction involves global growth restriction where the entire body, including the head circumference, is proportionally small compared to gestational age. This condition indicates an early gestational insult affecting overall fetal growth and development. Increased risk of neurologic sequelae. Both forms of intrauterine growth restriction are associated with a heightened risk of neurologic complications due to the compromised intrauterine environment. Maternal signs. Many mothers do not experience noticeable symptoms, indicating the presence of intrauterine growth restriction, making routine prenatal assessments critical for early detection. A key clinical sign of intrauterine growth restriction is a fundal height that measures at least 3 centimeters less than what's expected for the gestational age in weeks. This measurement is particularly relevant between 24 and 36 weeks of gestation. Observations of a smaller than expected uterus or abdomen, especially in comparison to previous pregnancies, may indicate intrauterine growth restriction. Complications such as placental abruption can present with vaginal bleeding, and there is an increased risk of preterm labor in cases of intrauterine growth restriction. Diagnostics Diagnosing intrauterine growth restriction involves a combination of imaging techniques, fetal monitoring, and assessments to evaluate fetal growth, placental function, and fetal well-being. Serial ultrasonography The cornerstone of intrauterine growth restriction diagnosis is serial ultrasonography which can detect decreased fetal growth, specifically a fetal weight below the 10th percentile for the gestational age. Ultrasonography also evaluates the placenta for signs of pathology, such as a small placenta or calcifications, which may indicate chronic placental impairment. A reduced amniotic fluid index, less than 5, suggests oligohydramnios, a condition often associated with intrauterine growth restriction and indicative of decreased fetal urine production due to compromised renal perfusion. Doppler Velocimetry Doppler Velocimetry of the umbilical artery is instrumental in assessing placental circulatory status. Reduced or reversed diastolic flow and an increased systolic-diastolic ratio are alarming signs of compromised fetal blood flow, reflecting placental insufficiency. Non-stress test 
The non-stress test evaluates fetal heart rate and responds to fetal movements. Late decelerations or bradycardia can indicate fetal distress, often associated with apoxia and placental insufficiency. Biophysical Profile The biophysical profile combines ultrasound evaluation of fetal movements, tone, and breathing with amniotic fluid volume assessment. Key findings in intrauterine growth restriction may include oligohydramnios, absent fetal breathing movements, decreased fetal movement, and tone. A score of 4 or less is indicative of fetal apoxia and or placental insufficiency, warranting consideration for labor induction to prevent further compromise. Treatment the management of intrauterine growth restriction focuses on addressing the underlying causes, monitoring fetal well-being, and making timely decisions regarding the delivery to optimize outcomes for both the mother and the fetus. Treatment strategies are multifaceted and tailored to the specific etiology, gestational age, and clinical scenario. Treating underlying conditions. Effective control of maternal conditions such as hypertension and gestational diabetes mellitus is crucial. This involves appropriate medication, dietary management, and regular monitoring of blood pressure and blood glucose levels to minimize their impact on fetal growth. Close monitoring of fetal status. Regular non-stress tests are conducted to monitor fetal heart rate patterns and identify any signs of fetal distress. Contraction stress test may be used to evaluate the fetus's ability to tolerate labor by observing the fetal heart rate and response to contractions. Biophysical profile assesses fetal health through ultrasound examination of fetal movements, muscle tone, breathing movements, and amniotic fluid volume, along with the non-stress test. Indications for delivery. Signs of fetal distress or deterioration in maternal health, such as the onset of preeclampsia, necessitate immediate evaluation for potential early delivery. The decision to induce labor or perform a cesarean delivery is based on the gestational age, fetal condition, maternal health, and the severity of intrauterine growth restriction. The mode of delivery is chosen to ensure the best possible outcomes for both mother and fetus. Steroid Administration If delivery is anticipated before 34 weeks of gestation, administration of corticosteroids 48 hours prior to inducing labor can significantly enhance fetal lung maturity, reducing the risk of respiratory distress syndrome and other complications associated with prematurity. Complications Intrauterine growth restriction poses significant risk not only during pregnancy but also postnatally affecting neonatal outcomes and potentially leading to long-term health issues. Stillbirth Intrauterine growth restriction significantly increases the risk of stillbirth due to placental insufficiency and the resulting compromise in fetal oxygenation and nutrient supply. Preterm labor Intrauterine growth restriction is associated with a higher incidence of preterm labor often necessitated by the need to deliver the fetus early due to non-reassuring fetal status or maternal complications. Low birth weight. Infants born with intrauterine growth restriction frequently have a birth weight below 2,500 grams, categorizing them as low birth weight. Low birth weight infants are at increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome and other neonatal complications. Perinatal asphyxia. Reduced oxygenation and blood flow to the fetus can lead to perinatal asphyxia, characterized by impaired gas exchange, leading to fetal acidosis, hypoxia, and potential organ damage. Hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia. Intrauterine growth restriction newborns are prone to hypoglycemia due to insufficient glycogen stores and hypocalcemia both of which require prompt recognition and management to prevent seizures and other complications. Hypothermia The lack of adequate fat stores in intrauterine growth restriction infants predisposes them to difficulty maintaining normal body temperature, leading to hypothermia. Motor and Neurological Disabilities Intrauterine growth restriction can have long-term effects on neurodevelopment potentially resulting in motor and neurological disabilities. These may include cognitive delays, learning difficulties, and other developmental challenges.
Image-Based Discussion Here's an image of umbilical artery Doppler waveforms with advancing gestational age and fetuses of appropriate size for gestational age. Note that the diastolic flow, valleys between peaks, increases with advancing gestation. Here's an image of umbilical artery Doppler flow velocity waveforms and fetal growth restriction. Note the low diastolic flow, arrows in panel A, absent diastolic flow in panel B, and reverse diastolic flow in panel C. Here's an image showing a comparison of middle cerebral artery Doppler velocimetry inappropriate for gestational age and severely growth-restricted fetuses. Panel A shows middle cerebral artery flow velocity waveforms in an appropriate for gestational age fetus, and panel B shows severe fetal growth restriction. Note the high diastolic flow in panel B, brain sparing effect, and high peak systolic velocity, V. The pulsatility index in panel A was 2.4 versus 0.97 in panel B. Here's an image showing a comparison of ductus venous Doppler velocimetry appropriate for gestational age and severe growth-restricted fetuses. Ductus venosus Doppler in an appropriate for gestational age fetus, panel A, and panel B, severe fetal growth restriction at 27 weeks of gestation. Note that the A wave is reversed in this case of severe fetal growth restriction. S stands for peak systolic velocity, D stands for the first part of the diastole, passive filling of the ventricles. Alpha stands for the second part of diastole, atrial contraction. AGA is appropriate for gestational age. FGR is fetal growth restriction. Here's an image of an infant with severe intrauterine growth restriction. The infant has a typical shrunken or wizened appearance. Differential Diagnoses when diagnosing intrauterine growth restriction, it's essential to distinguish it from cases where the fetus is constitutionally small. Constitutionally small fetus. Definition. A fetus with an estimated fetal weight below the 10th percentile for its gestational age without any identifiable underlying pathological condition causing the reduced size. Predisposing factors. Maternal stature and pre-pregnancy or early pregnancy weight can naturally limit fetal size. There is a noted predisposition among individuals of Asian descent, where fetuses tend to be smaller. The number of pregnancies a woman has had can influence fetal size. Female fetuses are often smaller than male fetuses. Diagnosis Utilizing growth charts adjusted for maternal factors, ethnicity, and fetal sex can help in accurately assessing whether a fetus is constitutionally small rather than growth-restricted. Normal findings in the umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry, specifically a normal systolic or diastolic ratio, support the diagnosis of a constitutionally small fetus, as opposed to intrauterine growth restriction where abnormal Doppler results are common. Prognosis Constitutionally small fetuses do not have an increased risk for adverse perinatal outcomes, contrasting with intrauterine growth restriction fetuses who are at heightened risk for complications such as apoxia, acidosis, and adverse neonatal outcomes. That's all for the video. We'll see you next time.